Dr. Steinecke is a research fellow at Max Planck, Florida, here in Jupiter. He earned his PhD at the Friedrich Schiller University in Vienna, Germany, and joined Max Planck as a postdoc in 2013. Special pleasure, of course, uh, to welcome another German uh, to the lecture series. And Andre is now working under Hiroki Taniguchi, uh, who has been studying early interneuron development, specifically the postnatal development of inhibitory circuits in the mouse brain. And for some, that might really sound like a lot of um, kettlebells or different kind of words thrown together. But uh, Andre will now make all sense uh, of it. And so I welcome Andre to take over the presentation. And I'm looking forward to a very exciting journey through the brain. Thank you very much, Stefan. And uh, thank you for having me on this very exciting um, uh, lecture series, Meet the Scientist. Um, would like to share some uh, insights into development of the nervous system and I titled my brain development from one single cell to the most complex structure known to humankind and I hope to uh, take everybody on this journey and hope to convey a little bit of, of um, what we gained in the last century actually how the brain develops. So thank you very much for joining and uh, let me introduce myself a little bit. Um, so as Stefan mentioned, I, um, I, I was born in Germany and I was actually born in the Eastern part of Germany. So uh, nothing little had to uh, happen and the, the wall, the Berlin wall had to fall so that I'm here today uh, to speak to you guys. So I did my PhD in the Friedrich Schiller University in Jena. This is right in the middle of, uh, of Germany right now. And uh, then I moved to Florida here and joined the Max Planck Institute for Neuroscience. And now I'm studying the uh, brain development. And a little bit more from my background. So um, I come from a family of farmers and workers, actually, that was uh, the uh, profession in the Eastern Germany and even before the war and, and stuff. And I'm actually the first PhD holder in the whole family. So to encourage everybody from a background with non-academic people, uh, you can you can do it. You can do uh, this kind of stuff and you become a scientist. Be curious and follow your interests and uh, you can you can you can develop a, a very good mindset and become a, a scientist and uh, everything your uh, developmental uh, origin uh, wants you to be. All right, let's dive in to the, to the science and uh, let me share with you the outline of my talk. So I have pretty much three points that I would like to convey to you today. So first of all, the brain as the most complex biological system. I would like to uh, convey to you that this is actually true. This is the most complex biological structure that we know. I would like to uh, share with you what we mean by complex, actually, if we speak of complex systems. The second point I want to make is how can actually one single cell give rise to the entire brain? So this is, this is really intriguing uh, as we have just a a small amount of genes actually in this one particular cell and how this is actually possible to give rise to billions of cells with different uh, uh, purposes and all this kind of stuff. So this is what I want to share with you today. And then the last part of my talk I want to uh, share with you is why is it actually useful to study brain development? You might think, oh, this has nothing to do with, with any diseases or anything like this it was just uh, uh, ground knowledge or whatever, and uh, this has nothing to do with real life, but I would like to, um, to convince you that this is not true and this is actually really close to um, human disease models and, and diseases such as autism and uh, schizophrenia and so on and so forth that we are studying here. Okay, let me start with my first um, slide here. So uh, I was asking the question, what makes the brain so complex? So um, what is it? So the first thing that comes to mind 
what is the human brain. If you look at it, it might be size, right? So we might have actually the biggest size uh, in, in terms of brains, but this is actually not true. If you look at these different brains here, we're, we have you know, the human brain, but actually a dolphin has a pretty big brain uh, that Stefan studies, right? They are very intelligent and they can do things nobody would have believed like 50 years ago. And an elephant, for instance, has a much bigger brain than we do. And so size is, is not what makes the brain so complex. But another idea could be relative size. So if you take the brain size and divide it by the body mass, so then the elephant is actually a pretty small over here. And uh, this is the, the elephant is, is not really good here. And the marmoset is the winner in this case, right? And it's actually then still larger than the human. So we're actually also not the top here. So relative size is also not the uh, thing that makes the brain so complex. What else could be? It, it could be um, relative complexity. So if you look for, for instance in uh, brains from different um, monkeys here, the macaque, the rhesus monkey, a gorilla, a chimpanzee, and a human, you can see that these uh, little grooves and hills that you see in our brains are, are getting much, much deeper and more pronounced in the human brain. And this is, and here in the macaque brain, it's very shallow and so on and so forth. So this is actually a, a good measure. So we have a very large surface of the brain. So this is something where we have a very high complexity. However, there are other animals, as I said before, elephant and uh, a dolphin, and even uh, other animals that have also these large grooves and a very large surface of the brain. So relative complexity is also not such a great measure for the complexity of the brain. So another thing that uh, comes to mind if we talk about the brain is like the number of cells, right? So the sheer number of cells is always astounding to the uh, people if you talk about this. So if you uh, look at a human brain, it has roughly 100 billion neurons. So 100 billion nerve cells in the entire brain. So this is a thousand, one million, one billion, a hundred billion. So this is really a big number. However, we have other organs in our body that have more cells. For instance, the human liver, who would have thought, has actually 116 billion cells. And uh, this is uh, um, a human uh, male that has like a 1.5 kilogram liver for instance, so there are bigger size and smaller size livers, for instance. Um, but this is actually not the winner if it comes to cell numbers. The winner is actually your gut and actually the bacteria in your gut, which are uh, very numerous, actually orders of mag magnitudes larger in terms of numbers. There are 38 trillion bacteria in your gut and uh, they might actually have an impact on your brain. This has uh, recent uh, studies have shown this that the gut microbiome actually affects your brain state and, and all these kind of stuff. But this is just a side uh, note here. And uh, just to say that they have an impact and uh, it's not actually yet known what kind of impact they have. But in terms of numbers, they are much more numerous than human uh, neurons. But this is also not, numbers is not what makes the human brain so complex. So what else could it be? How can we study this, right? So we can study this by just looking at the brain cells. And there are two guys in the beginning of the last century, or actually 150 years ago, something like this. Uh, two names are very, very prominent in neuroscience. One is Camilo Golgi, and uh, the other one is Santiago Ramon y Cajal. And what these guys did is uh, just looking at the brain with a particular staining method. So this Camilo Golgi came up with a silver staining method that actually just sparsely stains neurons so in, a, in a very random fashion. So what that means is the brain is full of neurons. So if you would stain them all, you would not get any idea of the entire morphology. So the entire look of one particular cell. But this method of his actually is able to stain just 
a particular small number of cells. And this allows us to uh, make morphological statements about a cell in the brain. And this Santiago Jamón y Cajal actually used that method and looked at several different brains of humans, of uh, monkeys, of cats, and so on and so forth. And he came up with a comprehensive analysis of the morphology, so the look of neurons in the entire brain. And he already also made statements about their connection, for instance. So these neurons are connected with one another. And he is pretty much the father of all morphology of these uh, neurons. So he stained all these cells in the, in the retina, in the cortex, and so on and so forth. So with this morphology, we can actually come a little bit further. So we can actually look at the brain and we can see that these brain cells look different. So what you see here is actually a slice of the human cortex. The cortex is actually the outer uh, surface of the brain. Uh, this is where all the cells lay and this is where all the action happens pretty much. And if you make a cut through this area right there, you can see that these cells all look different in certain layers. For instance, here in the upper layers, you can see these small cell types, these small soma here, whereas here you have like this bulbous structure and here these are even not necessarily neurons as well, uh, but they're also very small cells and so on and so forth. So there are different cell types. And what's also very astounding, if you look throughout the entire cortex of a human, for instance, you can find that several different areas of the cortex have a different cell uh, composition. So you can make uh, anatomy and look at this area and it's totally different than this area right here. And so you can make actually an atlas of the brain based on morphology. But what is, what is actually really astounding in the cortex is not necessarily the cells by itself, but all the cables. So if you look at, at these, these neurons, what it's kind of really looking like, it's, it's all these cables that connect all these neurons. So something like this, it looks like a, a forest right there with all these uh, very large elaborate structures, which we call dendrites and axons. And this is actually a very, very complex structure. And to make a uh, sense of this, this has not been possible since like very recently. And still nowadays, there is actually research being done on that particular issue. So it's the number of cell types and the connection of these neurons that makes our brain so complex. But now if we speak of cell types, what do we actually mean? So what's a, what's a cell types? So I, I already told you that morphology, so how the brain cells look like, plays a large role, right? So if you look at brain cells, you can see that they're, they come in very different shapes and forms and flavors. So for instance, you have these bipolar cells in the retina and so on. And then you have this very, uh, these, these numerous cells in the cortex that we call actually pyramidal cells because they have such a triangular pyramidal shaped uh, soma. These are the principal cells of the cortex. And then there are other cells, for instance, in the cerebellum that have like this large elaborate dendrite. This is the dendrite, what we call the input structure where they receive all the input from other neurons. And this is a very large structure and a very specific cell in the cerebellum. So these cells come in very, very different flavors in terms of morphology. And if you look at other cell types, you can see that they are very, very numerous in their morphology. For, for instance, they can, uh, they can have axons and dendrites that span all the layers of the cortex or they make horizontal connections and so on and so forth. So this is what we mean by morphology, how the cells look like. Another aspect of cell types is actually, um, yeah, so one aspect of morphology has been, has been done by this Ramon, uh, Ramon y Cajal. And uh, he was very, uh, fascinated by their morphology. And I like the statement that he uh, said once, uh, like the entomologists hunting for brightly colored butterflies, my attention was drawn to the flower garden of the gray matter, which contains cells with delicate, elegant forms, the mysterious butterflies of the soul, that beating of whose wings may someday, who knows, clarify the secret of mental life. So this is a very 
beautiful work of his and it's very comparable to the um to to the butterfly uh, uh to butterflies that come in in so many different shapes and flavors and colors and so forth and this is very comparable in the in the in, the, in these neurons okay and the, yeah he also received the Nobel prize together with um uh, camilo golgi and uh, this is really earned, and this is like the godfather of all neuroscientists still. Okay, another uh, aspect of uh, cell types is their physiology. So as you might know, these cells actually send action potentials, so little currents along their uh, axons, and this receives on the like, for instance, muscle cells or other neuron dendrites, and this is the information that is conveyed by these neurons, these action potentials, little tiny currents that is sent along the membranes. So, and you can actually uh, put a little needle close to, the, to one neuron here and actually inject a little current into these neurons and then measure how these cells actually react. So you can actually then ask, okay, what's the reaction of these neurons to a particular stimulus? And these neurons actually answer with a large variety of different answers. So if you can see here, if you inject a little current into this neuron, they actually then answer with like one action potential right here. Then for a little while, this neuron is quiet. Then another action potential, then quiet again, and then a little train of action potentials. Other neurons do that differently. They fire a couple of action potentials and then make a small pause and so on and so forth. Then other neurons fire very, very regularly, but in a small uh, frequency, whereas other neurons have a very high frequency and so forth. So these neurons come in different flavors in terms of physiology, that's what we call them. And then different cell types also have different connectivity. So you have to imagine every cell in the cortex, every neuron in the cortex makes approximately 1,000 connections to other neurons and also receives 1,000 connections from other neurons. And this is an astounding number. So this is a, a large, large network, a, a huge network that is, um, yeah, really, really huge. And it's also more complex in a sense that actually it matters where other neurons make their connections. So for example, if you look at this particular cell here, that makes connections, synapses, on the very, very far distal, we call it, very far away from the soma and where the action potential is actually generated. This is where this neuron makes their connections. And we call that, this has actually control over the input of the neuron, right? Whereas this cell right here, it actually makes a connection at the very point of the generation of the action potential down here. So it has decisive control over the output of the neuron. So this is very interesting to look at. And we in our lab, for instance, are interested in how these specific subcellular connections are being established. So connection is another uh, cardinal um, type of, of cell types or is, it, is a cardinal um, diversive uh, uh, thing to, to, to diversify the, the cell types in the brain. Okay, and another thing that I want to uh, share with you is gene expression. So different cell types in the human brain and in every other brain express different genes at a partic particular moment in time. So let me go into this uh, method a little more into detail because this is a very modern technique that uh, you might see in, uh, in popular media and so forth. So how does that work? How do we get to the gene expression of a particular neuron? How do we know which genes are expressed in this neuron at a particular time? So what does that mean, gene expression? One gene is expressed, so you know that there are um, roughly 20,000 genes and not all of them are expressed at the same time, meaning not all of them are turned on at the same time, leading to proteins that then have a certain function. So some are quiet, some are turned on. And the interesting question is now, which genes are actually turned on? So how do we do this? So we take actually living slices of brains and we cut out a particular region of this brain, in this case, the cortex or the 
um, or for instance, here the visual cortex, here is the anterior cortex. And then we uh, incubate these brain uh, tissue with some enzymes to actually digest it to somehow, to some degree. And then we have uh, single cells here. And then we can sort these single cells with a particular method, or we actually manually pick each single cell. And then in this single cell, we can actually then do a sequencing, which uh, starts by an RT-PCR. So all these mRNAs, so if you have a gene, the next step is an mRNA, and then the next step will be a protein. So we look actually at the mRNA to see which genes are expressed. And if we find the mRNA for, of a particular gene, we think that this gene is expressed. That's what, how we call this. So we actually, every mRNA has a poly A tail, so multiple adenosines. And then we can actually then sequence with a primer that has multiple Ts and then just read the sequence. Then we amplify this. Yeah, and then in the end, actually, we read the sequence here. And uh, this is how we know which genes are expressed. So if you do this for particular brain areas, then you, you end up with a, with a cluster, for instance. So you do some bio uh, statistics on it. And then you can cluster certain genes that express the same, uh, certain cells that express the same genes. You can put them together in a certain cluster. So these blue cells, for instance, they express roughly the same genes. Right? And then you can cluster them. And one cluster is what we can call a cell type according to their gene expression. Right? And then you can find all these different clusters that correspond to different cell types. And this is another way of putting this. So if you look at all these neurons right here, they fall into different classes right there. And this is the sheer number of neurons that are uh, distinguishable by that method of gene expression. This is a very modern method. This paper came out in 2019. So now uh, we have somewhat of a consensus of uh, what cell types express certain genes at a particular time uh, uh, in the brain. And uh, yeah, so, so this is very valuable knowledge to us. It's kind of a catalog now that we can actually then go in and target this particular brain cell with, uh, with a certain method and ask what this uh, cell type is actually doing during behavior or what's the function of this particular neuron. However, uh, our main question or the, the question I was asking is actually what, what is a cell type? So I still did not really answer that question, right? And uh, this is in particular due to uh, the complexity of the whole matter. But so what I've shown you so far is that you can distinguish cells based on their morphology, so how they look like, based on their connectivity, how they are connected to one another, and based on their gene expression, so which genes are on, which genes are off, and based on their physiology right here, how they fire and how they react under certain circumstances. So, and if you have a neuron and that falls onto certain criteria on that spectrum, you would call it a cell type, right? But if you go to conferences, then you could ask like big shots in the field. So, okay, what do you think? How many cell types are there in the brain? And these guys in the conference would tell you, oh, uh, so are you a splitter or are you a lumper? So what does that mean? Uh, if you are um, a splitter, then you would argue that there are no two neurons in your entire brain that are actually identical. So if you look at, at you guys, then, uh, and you'd pick two particular neurons. In different cell types, maybe they would express uh, genes that are not exactly the same as the neighboring neurons, and they would fire under certain circumstances that are a little bit different than, than the other cell. However, there are other uh, cardinal cell types that we can distinguish. For instance, um, there are two neuronal subtypes that are very, very broad in the brain. So I call them stop neurons and go neurons. So what I mean by this is if you look at this cell uh, and this gets input from these particular interneurons right here, 
And if these interneurons fire, they make this neuron less likely to fire an action potential right here. So this is what we call stop neurons. Whereas if these blue neurons right here fire, then they make it more likely that this particular neuron fires an action potential. And so we term them go neurons. So you can easily identify these two subclasses of neurons in the brain. And these have very, very distinct functions and they are very, very delicate. So you could think of them as having a balance between go and stop excitation and inhibition. And this is something what we um, call cardinal cell types in the brain. So roughly speaking, I would say that there are definitely more than 100 cell types in the brain. So we're definitely on the safe side there. And uh, this, is, this is more cell type than in any other organ uh, known to humankind. And this is what makes the brain so complex. All right, so let me shift gears here a little bit and um, show you this, this mouse brain depicted from the Allen Institute. This depicts like the whole connections of the brain cells with one another. And this brain uh, that you have is uh, doing like a lot of sensory processing. So it takes in all the sensations that you have from vision, from feelings, from touch, from, from everything uh, around you, then it integrates this information and it makes uh, a motor planning, so a behavioral planning, what's gonna do next. It also makes um, predictions about the future and, and so on and so forth. And you have it for learning and memory to make better uh, informed uh, behaviors in the future. And my whole uh, talk is about what are the developmental principles of this brain, right? How come that this structure that is the ground to all our behavior is developing? And uh, I would like to start uh, very early with a couple of ideas. So I would actually like to start in uh, with Aristotle that lived around 400 to uh, 320 before Christ. And um, I want to start with like embryonic development. So how can one cell actually develop into multiple different cell types that in the end form our brain? And Aristotle had already an idea about this. So he already thought that uh, uh, the adult organism is preformed in the embryo and just unfolds during development. He had another idea. It could also be that new structures are uh, permanently formed during development. And actually both of this is somewhat true if you, if you look at it and we get to it. Then another idea came from Seneca. He lived around uh, the birth of Christ. And he thought uh, some parts or all the parts of the human body are already contained in the semen. So there's, a, there's the body of you guys already in the semen and it just has to grow and then the human is, is ready. So he thought that the child in the belly of the mother already contains the roots for hair and beard. All right, so uh, not quite like that, but um, a little bit different. But my, my favorite part came actually from the Plinius the Older, which actually lived uh, after Christ, shortly after Christ. And he had an idea about development. And he states, for example, that bears mate during the winter time. So very specific. After that, females go into a cave. And after 330 days, she gives birth to mostly five cubs. At birth, these cubs are formless white clumps of meat, little bigger than mice. Only the claws are already developed. And the mother subsequently licks them into the right form. So this sound, this is also not quite right. But however, I, I just wanted to convey these ideas to you because um, I think this is, this is now a little bit funny, but uh, at that time they had an observation, right? They, they looked, oh, the bear is actually made, they go into a cave and then maybe they found something that looked a little weird and they couldn't really explain how it really works, right? And so they came up with a hypothesis, how it might work. And then 
later on and during the time, we got more observations and then we disregarded this, uh, this hypothesis and came up with a new hypothesis. And this is how science pretty much works, right? We make kind of like a hypothesis, an informed guess, right? We look at something, we think, okay, this is how it could work. And then afterwards, we look further and further and deeper and deeper into the matter, and we refine our hypothesis and make a new hypothesis, right? And that gets on, this goes on and on and on and on. And this is how science works, it never ends. And uh, we, we, we base our, our science on, on older observations. And I mean, Aristotle was not that wrong, whereas this guy was a little bit more on the wrong side, right? And, uh, but this is how it works. This is how science works. Okay, however, so to get everybody on the same page, I would like to share with you a little video from the Ellen uh, or from an HHMI website that deals with the uh, development of the human body. So I'm, I'm pretty sure most of you guys have seen this, uh, some videos like this. I just want to show you these videos so that we're all on the same page and that we can start from uh, the same um, uh, background more or less. Please let me know whether you hear this video or not. So let me play it to you guys. How does a human embryo form? First, an unfertilized egg travels from the ovary to the uterus through the fallopian tubes. Multiple sperm traveling through the tubes will try to fertilize the egg. Once one of the sperm is successful, development begins. The fertilized egg divides into multiple cells on its way to the uterus. After about five days, it forms a structure called a blastocyst. The cells inside the blastocyst, known as the inner cell mass, will eventually develop into the embryo. The outer cells of the blastocyst will develop into the embryo's placenta and other supporting tissues. Pregnancy begins when the blastocyst attaches to the wall of the uterus. The inner cell mass forms a disc, and the cells in the disc begin a process called gastrulation. First, some cells move inward, forming a groove on one side of the disc. This groove will determine the embryo's right and left body symmetry as it develops. As cells move inward along the groove, they organize themselves into three layers, the ectoderm, mesoderm, and endoderm. These three layers, called the germ layers, will develop into different parts of the embryo. As development proceeds, the cells continue to move, divide, and make new structures. About eight weeks after fertilization, most of the embryo's key body parts and organs will have formed. mind the music but this is pretty much what we see in biology class and uh, for for me it was always like oh this sounds so wonderful but how does it actually work right so all of a sudden you have a human body and with all its shapes with arms and legs and so on and so forth and eyes and ears and uh, this is this is somehow mysterious to to me and uh, how does that actually work so what I would like to, to show you in the next part of the talk is like about one or two concepts of how this actually happens. How can, uh, how can this develop from one particular cell into what of a, of a human body? So um, we have a, a couple of problems to do this, right? So for instance, we just have around about uh, 20,000 genes um, that encode for proteins uh, and that that whole genome of 20,000 genes has to regulate the entire development. So that means that one gene cannot regulate one aspect of development. So if you just have 20,000 genes, we have much more than, than 25,000 aspects of our body. One gene cannot do uh, only one aspect of our human body, right? 
So that means that uh, genes, single genes, have multiple, uh, uh, regulate multiple aspects of development, and multiple genes regulate multiple aspects of development. So how is that possible? How could you do that, that uh, certain genes have different, uh, um, different tasks to do during the development, right? So, and uh, there I have to introduce um, a concept called a transcription factor. So a transcription factor is actually also a protein that is encoded by a gene. So, and this protein has a certain function. So these proteins are usually depicted by this uh, very shyness bulbous structure, but in the end, it's a, it's a chemical structure made out of uh, uh, amino acids. So, uh, and this particular protein here is a transcription factor. And uh, the, this is a transcription factor because it can bind to DNA right here. This is the DNA and it binds to a particular um, structure of the DNA. So to a particular sequence of the DNA. And so if, if a transcription factor binds to its uh, DNA um, that, it, that it detects, this is mostly called the promoter region, which is in front of the start of, a, of another gene. Then these transcription factors, oftentimes multiple transcription factors, make it more likely that this gene is being expressed so that uh, mRNA is being formed and then a protein is formed and that protein has a certain function to start certain other functions. So expressing a, um, a rhodopsin in the eye, for instance, that you can see, right? That detects light, for instance. This is a, a protein or uh, several different other proteins, 20,000 we have. And then, so if this, these transcription friend, uh, factors bind to the uh, promoter, the RNA polymerase starts uh, the, the process of RNA polymerization, mRNA is formed, and then uh, proteins are formed. Now, transcription factors uh, are very important so that they can uh, turn on genes. But so one transcription factor right here can also turn on multiple genes at the same time, gene A, B, C, and at the same time, this transcription factors can also turn off certain genes. So this is depicted here. So you have no gene, no protein B, and then uh, gene E is also turned on again. So these transcription factors have multiple aspects by themselves already. So they can already somewhat make a pattern of expression if they are expressed in a certain cell, right? So they can turn on certain genes and turn off other genes. All right, but this would not give rise to certain different uh, cell types, right? If you have uh, one transcription factor turned on in one cell, all the genes uh, are, are expressed and, and that's it, right? But there, there is one possibility how this could work. And actually also uh, 150 years ago, August Weismann had already an idea how this could work. So you could simply um, distribute the, uh, the, the, the transcription factors differently in the nucleus. So he called it not transcription factors. He had no idea about genes or transcription factors and so on. He called it determinants. And these determinants could be just simply um, distributed in a different fashion so that if the cell is dividing, these determinants are in this particular cell and these are in this cell. And so then you could end up with determinants that actually just by the whole virtue of uh, their different distribution, end up with different tissues. So um, as it turns out, it's uh, somewhat right. It's not right in the nucleus necessarily, but uh, we could found we could have we could find later that actually there are uh, proteins and transcription factors that are asymmetric asymmetrically distributed in the cytoplasm. So one pole of the cell actually has these. Uh, transcription factors. And then if the cell divides, only one daughter cell actually gets these transcription factors, whereas the other cell doesn't. So then you end up with two different daughter cells. So this is something where just the distribution of proteins inside the cells can, uh, can lead to different cell types uh, subsequently. Okay, but this is obviously not the end of the story. So cells, uh, if, if this would be the case, actually, all cells would be predetermined and, um, and then also every cell would know from the very beginning what, uh, what, the, what their final destination and their final fate would be, 
And this is actually not the case. And how do we know this? We actually know this by transplantation experiments. So very early on, you have, for example, in the embryo, you have like two or three different regions as we saw in the, in the video. So if you think of region A in the Anlage and region B here, and this region A gives rise to hexagons and region B gives rise to squares or rectangles in this case. And so if you now take uh, one part of the green area here and transplant it into the yellow area, what would happen if the cell would be determined, predetermined is that it would make these rectangles no matter what these other cells around it would be. And this is actually true to some extent, uh, usually during late development. So these cells are determined, so it makes rectangles. But now, um, if you have cells that are actually not predetermined, they actually um, uh, develop like their surrounding cells. So in this case, if you transplant one uh, particular uh, region from the green uh, region to the region of, of the yellow uh, region A, then these cells actually now don't determine into rectangles. They determine into these uh, hexagons here. That means that the cells surrounding them have to actually tell them, hey, you are not in your rectangle region anymore. You are now in the hexagon region and you are now developing into hexagons rather than um, rectangles. And this is actually also true under, under very early uh, embryonic conditions. You can transplant certain uh, areas to other areas and they don't care where they came from. They develop just fine at the area where they are transplanted to. Whereas otherwise, uh, if, you, if you do that under in later uh, circumstances, you can actually take a tissue that would become a leg and transplant it to the back, and that would make another leg on the back of the, of the animal, for instance. Okay, so um, that means uh, certain cells actually determine the fate of other cells. So how does that now work? And uh, as you show, as it was shown in the video, we have this gastrulation that certain cells move inward the embryo. And after the gastrulation, there is a process going on called neurulation. And this neurulation actually means that the, that the back of the embryo is making a plate, and then this plate goes down and forms actually a tube. And this is your neural tube. And this neural tube is very important because this becomes your entire nervous system. So the, uh, the spinal cord in the back and then in the head part, this becomes the entire brain. And what you can see here is a structure called notochord. And this structure is very important to the formation of the uh, neural tube. If this neural cord is not placed very well, this neurulation is not uh, forming uh, properly. Also, there are other problems. If the neural tube doesn't uh, close, for instance, you might have heard of a, a condition called spina bifida, where you actually have uh, a condition with the open back, and these patients oftentimes cannot walk uh, properly. So this is a very important step during development. So how does this neural uh, cord actually do this? So there has been actually studies that showed uh, after the neural tube is formed that the notochord, if, you're, if this is placed here, um, then you have a floor plate right here. These are, other, these are uh, uh, three neurons, let's say, and there are other neurons on the side of this that will actually later form motor neurons. And so uh, how do we know that this notochord can actually determine these cells? Yes, these researchers actually transplanted another uh, notochord next to the, uh, to the neural tube. And sure enough, you could find that there is another floor plate forming on the side of the uh, neural tube. And then there are another sets of motor neurons formed at this part where they would have never formed. So somehow this notochord has the function of determining these cells. And how this works is this notochord sends out proteins in a, in a gradial fashion. So it makes a gradient where down here, the concentration of this protein is very, very high. And if the concentration of this protein is high, then a floor plate will form. And if it's getting lower, then motor neurons will form. And then the other neurons 
or the other uh, structures right here, they don't care necessarily about this protein anymore. So, and now if you, if you transplant it to the side like this, these neurons are exposed to a very high concentration of this protein, and this will form the, another floor plate. And to actually explain this with uh, other words, I could not explain that in a better fashion. And I would like to show you another video from the HHMI website, how this can actually then also determine certain cell types just by being exposed to different gradients in the tissue. So let me show this video. So let's look, for example, just at three cells here. They're equivalent in potential. They could give rise to any region of the nervous system, but by chance they occupy different positions, and that position exposes them to different concentrations of this graded signaling molecule. So you can see three cells exposed to three different concentrations of this signaling factor. These factors interact with cells by binding to receptors on the cell surface. And then by virtue of the amount of signal, you activate receptors to different amounts. And then as a consequence of that, you initiate the activation of a first set of these transcription factors that are sitting in the cell waiting for the signal. So these cells, these factors are present, but they need to be activated either by addition of a phosphate group or clipping off a bit of the protein. And so as a function of the concentration of signal, you activate different levels of these transcription factors, the purple triangles shown here. And these are proteins then that once activated will seek out target DNA sequences with which to bind. And we see at this point that there's a difference between these three cells measured in the different concentration of transcription factor. So the cell on the left has a low concentration that is sufficient only to bind to gene A, whereas the cell on the right has higher concentration and can activate genes A, B, and C. And as a consequence, these cells begin to acquire different profiles of gene expression in the way that we saw. And these target genes, by and large, are themselves transcription factors. So this is a cascade of signal to first transcription factor to second transcription factor that then these genes really start to um, mediate um, the process of establishing cell differences. And finally, through their secondary actions, cells acquire, in this case, different colors, but different identities. All right, so, so this is pretty much how this works, how you can be a cell um, and you're in a, in a part of a certain gradient and you acquire a certain. So okay, and is this just like in the nervous system? Is this just a particular a special uh, feature of the nervous system of a part of the cells and just a particular cell type? I, I can tell you, no, this is pretty much an underlying uh, concept of the entire development. And let me show you here, there are actually genes which, called, which are called Hox genes or homeobox genes that pretty much determine the anterior posterior axis of entire organisms, such as the fly. So what you can find here in the fly is clusters of genes that actually are turned on in the head structure, like this uh, yellow one right here, and then in the thorax, there's another cluster turned on, and then the green cluster is turned on in the back. And you can see that this is actually in order, right? So the first one is in the head, and the last one is in the back. And so this, these genes are actually determining the anterior posterior axis of the entire uh, fly. So yeah, you can say, okay, I don't care so much about flies, but this is actually the case in the human as well. So you can find pretty much the same homeobox genes. So homeo is actually really um, uh, homologous genes in the fly and in the human that, that actually determine also the anterior uh, structure at the head in the front, and then the posterior structure at the rump of the human being. And this is pretty much conserved throughout uh, the animal kingdom. And what researchers found how this is actually determinant of these structures in the fly, for instance, you could just clone, for instance, one more set of thorax genes in here between the, the thorax and the end, and then see what happens. And researchers did this, and like a normal fly just has like one set of flies. And if you then uh, make a, 
a duplication of the thorax genes, you have actually two sets of flies and they call this bithorax mutant. So this means these genes, the thorax genes are sufficient to start uh, another uh, program in here, another thorax program to develop an additional thorax in these fly. So these are very, very powerful genes that control the anterior posterior axis. And there are other genes that actually don't, uh, also Hox genes that actually also determine your um, extremities. And the, uh, these genes are actually, then there you have like five gene clusters that now determine your, your fingers and then also the, uh, the, the upper arm, the lower arm, and the hand bones, and so on and so forth. So these gene programs are very powerful to determine uh, basic big features of the development. And how does it actually work? So Hox genes determine the body axis in a fashion that actually the genes in the anterior part in the head are expressed in a gradial fashion. You can see that right here. And these genes in the anterior part they actually then are transcription factors to the next set of Hox genes. So these genes in the very anterior part turn on the next genes in the, in the posterior part, and they turn on the next genes and so on and so forth, so that you start the development at the head with the expression of the first set of Hox genes. And then from there, it's started and it's a self-organizing structure to go on until the very end of the organism. So by that means, these Hox genes, homeobox genes, determine the anterior posterior axis of the body. Okay, now let me go on to another example of uh, determinants and uh, a gene that is very, very interesting to us. And uh, it's not like 50 years old that this was discovered. It is a pretty recent thing. And uh, it's actually very interesting to us because it determines uh, cell types that uh, we are very interested in in our lab. So this uh, gene is called Sonic Hedgehog. And uh, yeah, these geneticists always have like very funny names for their genes. And this Sonic Hedgehog was also found in the, in the fly. And if you knock out this gene, these flies actually look like little hedgehogs, let's say, but they cannot develop very much further. Um, and uh, this is how this gene got their name. So this sonic hedgehog actually determines our stop and go neurons that I mentioned earlier. And how does it do that? So if you remember the uh, neural tube, you know, you remember maybe that there is a floor plate and this floor plate is now uh, certain cells in the floor plate that now express this sonic hedgehog gene. And this gene is expressed and makes a protein and this protein will be uh, secreted out. And now you have a gradient of sonic hedgehog that is a, a ventral. So the belly is down here and then the back is over here. So we call it ventral and dorsal. So the belly side expresses the sonic hedgehog and then the dorsal side will, will not express sonic hedgehog and will just uh, be uh, exposed to a small amount of sonic hedgehog. And what this gene actually does, it turns on certain other genes. If this is uh, just half of the neural tube right here. And this, if, if these cells in the neural tube are, um, are exposed to a low concentration of sonic hedgehog, they actually make go neurons. Whereas if these cells in the neural tube are expressed to, uh, exposed to a high amount of sonic hedgehog, they now actually make stop neurons in the ventral part of the neural tube. So these cells then migrate to the top and meet their go neurons, and then they form this nice network of the cortex, which will be developed right here. Okay, so this is how one factor can actually determine a, a cell type that is very, very Im, uh, important in the brain uh, during very early embryonic development. Okay, and as I said before, these stop and go neurons have different functions. So they are uh, stopping these neurons from firing and they are saying, okay, now go fire and be more likely to fire action potentials. And they actually make a very delicate balance. So if you think of these neurons, if you have too much inhibition, you might actually fall asleep. And then if you have more inhibition, you fall into the coma 
And then even more inhibition, it prevents you from breathing and then you die. And then on the other side of the spectrum, you have too much uh, uh, excitation, so less inhibition. You actually go into an arousal state. And if you have less and less inhibition, you actually uh, become epileptic, so you seize. And then after that, you actually also die, right? So there is an, a very delicate balance of this go and stop neurons in the brain that is important. So the number of uh, go and stop neurons is very uh, highly preserved. That means the number is pretty much similar throughout several different species. And uh, also how they develop is, is still under debate and is still under uh, scientific, scientific investigation. And in my lab, we actually then uh, uh, also work on these interneurons, how they develop. So, as I said before, there is, a, there is a very delicate balance between these two uh, normal subtypes, but they also do other things. For example, these interneurons, they actually are involved in the timing of the spiking. So um, they inhibit a certain uh, cell type, and then if they don't inhibit them anymore, they allow them to fire. So the timing of the spikes is very important, uh, as you can imagine. And then they are also in, uh, important for the oscillation. You know? So if you ever had like an EEG, an electroencephalogram, you could see all these little waves and maybe smaller waves and so on and so forth. So these neurons in the brain actually oscillate in several different frequencies. And the establishment of these frequencies is very important. And these neurons, these interneurons actually play a very delicate role in these oscillations. And if this all doesn't work really well, then you could actually find yourself on a, a disorder side. So there are actually brain disorders such as schizophrenia, autism, depression, post-traumatic stress disorder, and epilepsy that are all uh, uh, impl uh, implemented or they are they have underlying causes that are that are um, affected by the balance of excitation and inhibition in the brain. So if these interneurons are not working really well, you might get schizophrenia, autism, depression, and so on and so forth. Okay, so I was just trying to convince you that these interneurons are very important. And so in our lab, we actually study one particular interneuron subtype in a very uh, uh, large fashion. These are called chandelier cells. And these chandelier cells, they just have the morphology that resembles a chandelier. So you have the soma and then the axon. And these axons are uh, innervating the um, output of the pyramidal cells. So the actual structure where the uh, action potential is formed. And they are very uniform in their uh, synaptic and axonal organization. And we actually now have genetic access to these cells because we know which genes are expressed at a certain time. So we can manipulate these genes and uh, knock out certain genes that, are, that we think are important for their development. So, and uh, one of my projects in the lab was actually to knock out certain genes and ask whether these axons form in a particular uh, way, in the proper way. And if we do this under certain uh, control conditions, these form nice axonal arbors right here. This is a normal cell. But if we knock out an acetylcholine receptor, nicotinic acetylcholine receptors, these are genes that form a receptor that uh, binds, for instance, nicotine. So if you smoke, for instance, nicotine binds to these receptors, activates these receptors, and makes also the cell more likely to fire action potentials, in, uh, in fact. And if you knock out these genes during development of these interneuron subtypes, they form a smaller axonal arbor in this case. And this is very important because in that manner, they don't innervate as much go neurons uh, subsequently. So we believe that these mice, we do this in mice, these mice have a, a higher uh, chance of firing of the GO neurons, so they are more likely to develop uh, uh, states like epilepsy and so forth. Okay, we also tried to, to, um, to manipulate the acetylcholine in, uh, in the brain. So uh, it, it's not necessary you smoke to get like nicotine in the brain to activate these receptors. There's actually a source of acetylcholine in the brain, which is down here in the brain. This is also just a brain, uh, half of the brain. Here is our cortex. And down here, there are also other neurons sitting. 
that actually produce the acetylcholine that will be transferred through uh, long, long axons to here where the chandelier cells develop. And then if these neurons are activated, then they release the acetylcholine over here and they activate the chandelier cells to, um, to properly develop. So now we have actually the, uh, the method to inhibit these neurons from firing so they don't fire anymore. And now they don't um, uh, send out their uh, acetylcholine anymore. And under control conditions, they just form uh, nice axonal arbors. But if we inhibit these guys from uh, uh, transmitting their uh, acetylcholine in the brain, they also show this smaller axonal arbor right here. And this means that this source of acetylcholine is very, very important for these uh, chandelier cells to actually form a proper axonal arbor in the brain. And so if this is not um, not working really well, then smaller amounts of go neurons are innervated again. So you have uh, uh, more, you shift the balance more towards the epilepsy phenotype. Okay, so this is how we think of it. So we, we think of it as the, the activation of these basal forebrain neurons. This is where these acetylcholine actually comes from, is very important for their development. If it's too low, you have a smaller axonal arborization, then you, so under normal circumstances, you find yourself on a spectrum that uh, forms this axonal arborization in a normal fashion. And if it's too high, so then you form too large of an arbor of axons, and this will also lead to malfunctions. And there's actually um, uh, cases where very, very young kids already start smoking. And we believe that this might actually lead to a condition of attention deficit hyperactivity uh, syndrome uh, if, if kids, for instance, smoke too early. So this will lead to um, too high inhibition. So uh, leading these neurons and the brain circuit toward the other side of the balance, so too much inhibition, right? Okay, so this, is, this was uh, what we do in our lab. And I would like to shortly go into the future direction. So why does it actually matter to study brain development. In our lab, we actually found that you can actually transplant healthy interneurons into brains of mice. So as I showed you before, these interneurons are born in a very particular place in the neural tube. So if this is the late neural tube, let's say these interneurons are born in that particular area. So we can take them out of embryos and we can take them take them out and actually then electroporate them. So, so what we do is we actually transfer uh, certain genes into these cells to, for example, repair certain mutations that these uh, neurons have, or we express certain other uh, proteins that we want to know what the function of these proteins are and so on and so forth. And if we transplant these neurons to very young animals, they develop into normal looking chandelier cells just like that. And this is very, very interesting. So we can imagine, for instance, in the, in the human condition, if, for instance, we have uh, humans with epilepsy or schizophrenia and so on and so forth, if we would know which particular cell type is malfunctioning in their brain and where, we can actually then not take like embryonic tissue, but we can actually take skin tissue and then uh, reprogram skin cells into functioning neurons and also functioning subtypes of neurons and transplant these neurons into the diseased brain and hopefully in the future um, uh, heal these patients from epilepsy, for instance. So this is a uh, future, but this is in the making and is already being done to some extent. And uh, this is also then, after hearing my entire talk, this is also very, very important to know your cell types, to know which cell types you want to target and to know in the patients which cell type is actually affected in the disease. Another strategy to, to go after these diseases is a virus-based gene therapy. So these days, I bet you hear a lot about negative uh, things about viruses. But I would like to uh, end my talk telling something positive about viruses. So we in neuroscience and other fields, we actually use viruses, adeno-associated viruses. They come from birds. 
uh, to do gene therapy. So how this works is we, we make viruses and they contain certain DNA that then actually will be transferred into cells. The DNA will then be released inside the cells and the DNA will lead to the expression of certain proteins or will actually then um, repair certain uh, uh, gene defects or mutations in the, in, the, in the cell where the virus actually docks onto. So again, the requirements that the gene therapy is actually working is that you know the proper cell type where the virus should bind to, and you can make the virus then bind to the proper cell type. Then you have to know the mutation that you want to repair with these genes. And if you think of uh, developmental diseases, you have to have an early diagnosis of the, uh, of the disease. So if, for instance, epilepsy, schizophrenia, they start during adolescence and you have to diagnose them relatively early to make a proper, um, to, to, to heal the development of the, of the proper network in the brain. Okay, so with this uh, positive outlook on viruses, I would like to end my talk and I would like to thank uh, my boss, Hiroki Taniguchi and all the lab members and uh, the Max Planck Florida Institute for having me here and allowing me to do the research that I'm doing. And it's a, it's a, a nice journey and a, and, a, and a pleasure to work here and my funding source. And uh, thank you very much, Stefan, for organizing this very nice Meet the Science um, uh, uh, series to allow me to speak in front of a nice audience like this. And uh, please feel free to ask me any questions. Um, ready with my talk now. All right, Andre, thank you so very much. And a big hand out of applause. Uh, you can't hear it, but it's there uh, to <laughs> thank you for a wonderful presentation. And uh, I have already uh, sent out a message, get ready for questions and Kevin Pena uh, question. And you can actually read it, uh, I think, uh, yourself in the oh. chat box. And if you just read it out loud so everybody can hear it, yes. uh, that would be great. And anybody just type in, a question and send it, and then we'll spend as much time as we can. Uh, the latest, uh, they're gonna cut us off is 8.30, but that still gives us uh, 20 minutes. And okay. so uh, anyone uh, sitting at home uh, or elsewhere uh, having a question for Andre, please don't hesitate to send it in and I'll hand yeah. it back over to you uh, so you can read out the questions and then uh, talk about the answers. Yes, so Kevin Pena is asking, I have a student with a question. If your brain is always growing new dendrites and making new neural networks, does that mean your brain is getting bigger? That is a very nice question. And uh, actually it's not getting bigger every time. It's actually getting very, very big during development. And at some point that stops. So we don't make new neurons anymore. And uh, all the networks are actually um, formed in a large scale. But during adulthood, and if you learn new memories, we actually see structural phenomena that actually reshape their connection. So you make new connections, but just on a synaptic level. You won't have a motor neuron that sits in your motor cortex, for instance, that is able to make a whole axon all down your spinal cord and innervate another motor neuron to innervate your, uh, your motor uh, output system, the muscles, right? So that's why um, you have a, an accident and you break your spine and stuff like this, we, you, you won't grow these neurons back. However, you can still learn new memories. Um, uh, you, you can consolidate memories and this is being done uh, in part by structural re, uh, reforming of synapses in the brain. So tiny structures like synapses uh, will form, tiny structures from axons will grow out and uh, innervate tiny structures from dendrites, but that you won't be able to see on a large scale, right? So, and at the same time, if you form a memory, it's very, very important also to reduce certain other structures. So certain synapses are being reduced while certain other synapses are formed. And this is what we think of uh, uh, memory is being formed. Right, I hope that answers the question. So it doesn't get larger, really. Uh, it's also constrained by our skull uh, and really grow out there. Um, all right. 
does the process of creating synapses for connections ever stop? No, that doesn't. So um, the only thing that stops by and large is producing neurons, right? So um, there has been studies out there that we still make some neurons to some extent, but this is actually very controversial in the human uh, particularly. And by and large, we don't make new neurons, but we make new connections inside our cortex. So our cortex is still very plastic, that's what we say. And uh, this is in part due to, um, we, we have to adapt to new environments all the time. And this is why the cortex uh, stays so plastic and we have to make new memories all the time and, and so on and so forth. So this never stops, even if you're 95, new memories are being formed. If this goes uh, in, a, in a disease, uh, you, might, you might have heard of like Alzheimer's disease and so on and so forth, where you actually lose brain structure. And in the beginning, you lose synapses and you can, your, your, your brain can actually compensate for this in a, in a very large fashion. And at the very end, you just lose neurons. And this is where it actually becomes very, very severe, where you then actually lose large parts of memory and so forth. Okay, the next question by Timia is, what is the difference between brain neurons and normal neurons? Um, uh, well, so brain neurons, if I'm speaking of the brain, I mean the particular part of the, of the nervous system that is uh, in the in the head, right? So these are the brain neurons, whereas you have also other neurons that are sitting in your spinal cord. This is also part of your neural system. And uh, this is like spinal cord neurons, for instance, motor neurons and so on and so forth. So this is, uh, this is different. Uh, you can make a difference about this, but they are actually not so different. So they fire and upon their firing, you move a muscle and it's more likely for the subsequent structure to fire action potentials or make a lot of signal to contract the muscle and so forth. Okay, so so normal neurons, I don't know if they're normal neurons. We, we just call them neurons. And if I say normal neuron, maybe I, I refer to uh, an, a neuron that was not, uh, that, that was a control or something like this where we, where we actually use it to compare uh, a, a neuron where we actually knocked out a gene or something like that. That's what we call a normal or controlled neuron. Okay, another question from Amaria. Uh, how complex is your brain if you have lots of cells in your brain? And how does your brain contain memory? Yeah, so uh, the first question, I don't know if I understand it right. So how complex is your brain if you have lots of cells in your brain? So you, um, you have a lot of cells in your brain and they are, so as I said, each neuron is connected with uh, a thousand other neurons. And this is what makes them so complex, right? So one billion neurons that are connected to uh, a thousand other neurons. So you have um, uh, trillions of connections, right, in the brain. And this is what, what makes it really complex. And so uh, the complexity is also uh, the, so we, we cannot really have a handle on this. So what we would like to do as neuroscientists is to record from every neuron and every behavior possible. And if we could do that, we could make um, a computer or something like this, or we could reconstruct the, the, the brain and we can actually understand how the brain actually works. And this is impossible right now because the, num uh, the neurons are so numerous and all the connections are so numerous. So this is why this is complex. And then the second question was, how does your brain contain memory? So this is really still a very, very uh, big question and uh, neuroscientists don't have a, a hard answer for this. However, um, if you, uh, so you know that we, we think that synapses are actually the, the base of memory formation. So how does that work, right? There has been studies in, uh, in nails, for instance, so very, very um, basal uh, uh, reflexes, for instance, where you, you can see, okay, they can learn something. So if you, if you for instance, uh, tickle them, then they, they close a, a certain structure of, with a muscle, right? And if you tickle them too much, they don't do it anymore. So this is habituation, we call that. And what happens over time is that they actually build new structures 
to, to prevent them from firing too much. So the, you build new synapses, and this is how memory is being, is being uh, formed. We, we also have a, a thing called uh, long-term potential. So if you, for instance, stimulate neurons and the post, uh, so the two neurons are connected with one another and they fire at the same time, that makes it very likely that they form structures that connect them to one another. And this is how we think a memory is being formed. And uh, this, uh, it goes on and on. So a memory also has to stay somewhere, right? So, and uh, we think also these brain rhythms are also um, containing certain memories. And so uh, how, you, how you get to certain memories is very, very fascinating, right? So sometimes you have a thought and it just appears to you, right? And how this actually happens is, is, is still very controversial. So um, we think that, for instance, the hippocampus plays a role in there. So uh, how this works is you, you, uh, you can think of it by walking through a certain path of activity, and this activity points to certain activities in the cortex. And this pointing is then being kind of reloaded, and then actually a thought comes up, and this is being uh, uh, represented to your consciousness, right? So it's very, very complex. Um, we can talk maybe uh, my colleague Anant will go into this more in like, I think two weeks or something like this. January. Memory formation and so on. Yeah, he's going to be there in January. Ah, okay, in January. Okay. So there are other groups that, that work on this. All right, the next question uh, by Tinia. If my brain is sending a signal to the quads to contact followed by a signal to relax when walking, for example, is it a different neuron that brings the re relax message down to the muscle? So, yeah. So, so this is this is also very interesting, right? So, um, actually, you have you have motor, so you have always antagonistic muscle. I'm not the most muscular guy, but <laughs> one one muscle is actually then flexing your muscle, whereas the other guy is uh, is unflexing it, right? And so these two muscle groups are innervated by different motor neurons, right? And one muscle per se is also innervated by multiple, multiple different neurons. So each muscle fiber actually is, is innervated by, uh, by one particular neuron, but one neuron oftentimes innervates multiple different mu uh, muscle fibers. So in the large muscles in your leg, for instance, this can be up to a thousand muscle fibers. So these uh, muscles have movements that are more, uh, uh, yeah, like walking and things like this. But if you need like very fine muscles, something like the eye muscles and so on, there's only one neuron that innervates one muscle fiber. And this can uh, lead to a very, very fine uh, motor movement in your eye muscles, for instance. So your eyes need to be coordinated in a very, very fine tuned fashion. And this is how this works. So, so every muscle fiber in your eyes is innervated by a different neuron, for instance. Right? So this is how you get to fine uh, neural structures. And uh, yeah, this is a very, very coordinated process uh, it being done by the cerebellum, for instance, how you make these fine muscle movements. And uh, this is not a very, very um, easy process by uh, relaxation. And I mean, the muscles relax and, and tense, that's for sure. But to make fine motor structures, this is very, very complex. And if this goes wrong and the neurons actually also die, for instance, you can end up in like a condition called Parkinson's disease where you, you get shivers and, and, and all these kinds of stuff. So you cannot innervate the muscle structures in a very fine-tuned manner anymore. Very good question. Um, can, another question by Lewis Moore. Can sleep deprivation or abnormality lead to cortical atrophy? What relationship does abnormal sleep have to Alzheimer's disease? Okay, so... <clears throat> That's a, a very a, a question about sleep. Okay, so it has been recently shown that sleep is um, correlated with depression, for instance. So, <clears throat> and and also uh, with with memory consolidation. This this has been shown uh, very very early on. So um, during sleep, what what happens is still also a little bit mysterious to people, but 
um, what we think is that during sleep there is memory consolidation. So memories are being uh, being uh, relived, let's say. So if you dream, for instance, your hippocampus follows the the trajectories of memories that or or of, of instances from the day again, but now actually it's like decoupled a little bit from the cortex. So the cortex actually plays more or less random things to the hippocampus. And so you, you end up with like certain dreams that don't necessarily make too much sense. However, this, le this leads to memory consolidation. Now, sleep is, has also been um, related to Alzheimer's disease. And this has something to do with um, uh, with 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 the uh, with with the clearance of uh, proteins in the brain. So, if there, so during the day, what happens in your brain is that your neurons fire, fire, fire all the time, and that leads to the segregation of proteins and so forth. And this is being cleared out by uh, water or like your uh, cerebral spinal fluid during sleep, and it has been shown that in Alzheimer's patients, this clearing of the proteins is not done in a very uh, proper way. It has also been shown recently that uh, proteins called aquaporins uh, can be uh, affected in Alzheimer uh, patients. These aquaporins are actually proteins in the membrane of cells that actually let water through. So this is kind of like a little shower to your brain that actually flushes out all the waste and in uh, certain Alzheimer patients, this doesn't work really well. And so this is a very, very um, big topic right now in Alzheimer's research, how sleep affects Alzheimer's patients. And uh, it has been shown that uh, Alzheimer's patients, by and large, can't sleep very well. So whether this is a correlation or a causation is still under debate a little bit, but it has something to do with the clearing of uh, protein dippers and cell dippers. All right. So I think that was the uh, the last question. Uh, thank you very much again, Andre, for a wonderful yeah. evening of uh, super interesting things about our brain and how uh, out of one single cell eventually uh, wonderful thinking machines, at least in cases of most people, emerges. <laughs> and uh, if you want good. to ask more questions, please uh, feel free to to send me email addresses, follow me on Twitter, or send me messages on Twitter, and uh, I'll answer them as much as I can. Okay, very good. So we'll we'll pass on your email address to the teacher at that school. Yes. And for the uh, adults that have tuned in tonight, uh, also a special thank you for participating and attending. And if you would like to uh, have the contact and you cannot uh, find it yourself, please uh, reach out to us um, at the Taurus Oceanographic Foundation and we'll pass the information along. Again, thank you very much, Andre, for spending the time with us. It was absolutely fascinating. And thank you very much for tuning in. And uh, we'll see you back here on December 8th. Uh, that's the next date for our Zoom lecture as the Meet the Scientist lecture series. And with that, uh, with that said, um, I wish everybody a good night. Uh, have a good week. Uh, stay safe. And thank you very much, Andre. Um, it was absolutely uh, fascinating. Thank you. Thanks for having me.